After looking at their free cache, our next stop is now their 2cache tar, together with this more core piece or core extension. We go through the same routine again and blend in the elements we already saw once, but we make it quick. For the second time we can spot the true arrangement of D, E and L, but what really catches the eye in general is the small core area, where everything is kinda special and surprising. We have two D units, which are placed really close to each other, in all other cases there's a larger distance between the elements. Right to the D components are two P elements with the embedded G units, which are also located very close to each other, and in addition they are laid down mirror symmetrical, unlike the rest of the other elements. We can find P only two times per small core area, and once per free cache, it doesn't exist anywhere else. Nearly the same properties hold true for the two M parts, they are also quite close together and appear only here, and once in the cross shaped area, inside one or three cache. And lastly we have three G units, which are placed next to each other, where usually just one is planted. All other cases, where we can locate more than one unit at one place, are found around the GMI interface. In regards to the new elements, I like to bundle the marked air structures together. They look like clay, but as far as I know they are not made out of clay. Beyond the two cache tiles, such clay lines are used multiple times in the GMI section, and just one thick line per L3 cache. We can just put a question mark behind the functionality, and wonder about the next structures, framed in red. The S bricks form a horizontal line at the top and bottom, spanning across each core and a 2 cache. Their usage might be tied to power control of this range. Now we are going to solve the area division between the core piece and the 2 cache. Thanks to the high resolution of the new die shot, the fine lines are much more visible and easy to follow. That way we get 0.09 square millimeters for the green core region and 0.72 square millimeters for the 2 cache tile. In that numbers the bricks and some empty spaces included, but I would count that to the overall design. However, if you don't like to, you can subtract about 0.02 square millimeters for each region. <clears throat> Future spoiler, there's actually a solid reason behind believing the simple marketing scheme on the left and the fine lines being a good indicator for the area breakup of many high level blocks. Folding up is the exciting inspection of the data race. Similar to the free cache design, we do not see one large memory structure, but in fact two 256 KB byte sized chunks. Contrary to the free cache, the green memory cells are evenly split and each part looks more like it belongs to one yellow data ray. Another small difference is that only in the middle we have some dual memory cells, with the rest being single place cells, while on the free cache side it's the opposite. We have mostly dual cells there and just very few single memory cells. Right away we can make another very interesting observation when we compare the data arrays of the L2 and L3 caches. One L2 cache array needs 6 to 10% more space if you simply equalize the area consumption for 256 kibibyte. A natural question from a layman probably would be why does AMD not use the same array design for both caches? Well, each design has its own characteristics in terms of area utilization, the achievable bandwidth, frequency and its energy consumption. There's a fine balance point as to when to choose which design for what purpose. For us it's already great to know in what ballpark the area difference lies. A single data array is made out of 4 rows and 4 columns, 2 columns in the middle are placed directly next to each other, and one data element or subarray is storing 16 kibibytes. Furthermore, each subarray has 8 memory blocks, accordingly one block should store 2 kibibytes. When we compare the subarrays of the different caches, we can determine that the L3 cache subarray takes about 73% more space on the chip for twice the capacity. If it would be possible to cut the free cache subarray in half, then the two cache subarray would take about 16% more area for the same 16 KB storage size. Our finishing touch will be a short look at the transistor logic. Between the small memory cells, we have a relatively symmetric outcome. If we close one eye, the upper and lower logic on the left also appears similar, though there are definitely some differences. In the middle is a larger blob, potentially does something related to the control and synchronization of the other logic structures. At the top are likely two different logic blobs, because the small core piece itself seems to be composed of two functional areas, at least that's what the fine lines indicate. It's a good question what's happening there. Closing this video chapter will be a look at one CPU core, probably the most exciting aspect for many. In this regard we are very lucky, since AMD published many slides with fine details about it. We are not selling mostly blind anymore, so let's go through the information. The first piece is a basic overview about the microarchitecture, which we briefly looked at in part 1 already. But as said, even for a simple layperson, the information is easy to follow. Obviously it will be interesting to see if the real layout of the core even follows this high level diagram or the other slides. One could argue that till this point it was quite straightforward to figure out several details based on the marketing slides, at least for the very high level units, the caches and the data arrays. 
In any case, Zen2 starts with the frontend looking at the next program counter and installing branches in the branch prediction unit. This could be a larger logic blob and its own functional area. Now after the first stages, the pipeline flow is using one of two options. If necessary, Zen2 is fetching instructions from the L1 instruction cache, which should be easy to locate after our experience with the L3 and L2 caches. The decode stage transforms four x86 instructions into easier to handle operations and places the results into the micro op queue. The other option is to go through the faster and more efficient op cache, which stores up to 4000 instructions or rather operations which are already decoded. We could expect that this op cache is also using memory cells, but its size and form might be not that obvious. At least the description isn't for us. Chewing through the operations is the job of the execution backend, which is split into an integer and memory operation site on the left and the floating point unit on the right. In this diagram, each execution domain has its own renaming unit, which changes the register names to eliminate false dependencies and to enable a higher level of instruction level parallelism. On the left side, there are seven schedulers for the... That's not right here. There are five separate schedulers for the seven execution pipelines. Four for each integer pipeline and one unified scheduler for the three address generation units. If we are lucky, we will see four comparable structures for the integer pipes and three for the HUs. The register file has 180 entries and is the storage structure, which could use similar memory cells as the caches, or maybe not, we hopefully can find that out. On the right side, we have two, float two floating point units. It looks like one with four pipelines, but let's keep that in mind for reasons. The next slide gives us crucial information about the translation local site buffers, which are caches storing virtual to physical translated addresses. There are two levels for the instruction and data tailbees. The L1 is 64 entries large for both, the L2 instruction tailb holds 512 pages, and the L2 data tailb even 2000. On the following page, we go deeper into the specifics of the fetch step. The text on the left mentions a new page predictor and larger branch target buffers for all three levels. 16 entries for the L0 BTB, 512 for the L1, and 7k for the L2. In addition, there's an indirect target array holding 1000 entries. That sounds like a bunch of storage room to keep my eye for. Moreover, the image on the right shows the logical flow and helps us to visualize. It starts with the next program counter, goes down to the three TLB levels. Huh. The last page only mentioned two levels. Furthermore, the box below on the left only states two levels for the BTB. Okay, we have a contradiction between the text and the picture, as if life as a layman isn't hard enough already. Likely AMD just mixed up the levels, however, we really have to clear that up. The company also released an architecture slide deck for the server products. Again, three levels for the instruction TLB are shown, but also three for the BTB. It's getting funny. Basically, the same was presented at the Hotships conference. Together, we have at least three times the notion that the BTB has three levels, which is also true for Zen 1. We have two statements about the TLB having three levels, yet no slide deck mentions the size of the first L0 TLB. Maybe AMD published information about that for Zen 1. Let's look back. <laughs> Eight entries for the L0 TLB, supporting all page sizes and just two levels for the BTB of unknown size. Fortunately, we can consult another source, the software optimization brochure for Zen 1. It states on page 25, the AMD Family 17H processor utilizes a two-level TLB structure. The given storage size matches the specs on the other slides. For the BTBs, it says we have a three-level structure. Again, all sizes align with the other text information, so we can assume that this is correct and is on one slide and the images are wrong. The optimization guide for Zen2 also states a two-level TLB and a three-level BTB structure with matching size numbers. Back on track, besides the BTBs, we have a 32 entry return address stack and the indirect target array. Inside the right box are the branch predictors and the results flow into the prediction queue and micro tags for the L1 iCache and opcache. Next up is the decoding path, starting with the instruction byte queue, a pick step and then the decoding stage. The bottom half of the diagram also expands the high level overview with a stack engine, the memory file and the microcode DROM. The latter stores like the firmware for the microprocessor, which controls and defines multiple aspects of the CPU. This can be used to fix bugs or security issues with changing the behavior of the CPU. Microcode is also used to implement more complex instructions. It could be another larger storage structure to take into account. For the floating point unit, we get to know the depth of the various queues in the register farm. Further, AMD tells us the schedule queue size for integer and HU pipes and the size of the reorder buffer. Lastly, we are going down to the load and store implementation. 
Again, with the QSS numbers, a couple of more specifics, and now equipped with all that knowledge, we surely can dig out some details about the core. Let's get started. Okay, honestly, a lot of the information was not suitable for tier 2 layman, which is why we didn't really went through it, but even a tier 3 layman couldn't just casually look at the core and annotate all units. Nonetheless, we are not completely lost and we will see how far we can get. We start in classic fashion with labeling the unique elements which we already encountered. In total, we have 6 D, E and L units. 4 times in the same true arrangement. On the very left, they are also close together. While in the middle only a pair of D and E exist, with one L unit being alone. Then, two elements of K and N are located inside the core. Since all listed items can be found mostly everywhere, across the chip, sometimes alone, sometimes together, it really appears as if most all of them are sensors, be it for temperature, frequency or voltage. And yes, on the left a real sensor party is going on. Now F forms two border lines, the right is between the core and the L2 cache, but the left one separates the core into two segments. The short F line at the top appears quite randomly placed, it's hard to make sense out of the arrangement. Our S bricks are the last elements we already saw, new to us are the T units, each core has two of them, in addition many are present in the middle of the chip. Their functionality is not clearly evident. Wrapping it up with the U component, it's only found once per core, nowhere else, alongside the T units, it earns a question mark from us. One great thing which we can do next is to follow the fine lines and highlight them. It's a real blessing since we have many memory and logic blocks, which we can now separate to a certain degree. Coloring the sectors improves the overview further, and adding numbers and letters puts the cherry on top of the cake. We have 17 zones in total, where zone 1 to 3 exist two times in a similar fashion, leading to 40 more distinct areas. Putting that overview in contrast to the marketing high level diagram might finally clear up something. No, it didn't, at least not directly. At best, for some, it's obvious that the recall floor plan doesn't follow the marketing scheme, not even on a basic level. However, without thinking more deeply, we won't be able to find out the functionality of any zone. But we'll try to use a couple of brain cells in the next part. Till then, have a great time. Bye bye.